Hello and welcome and welcome back. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome our final presentation of the day today of day one, Textile Design the Path Forward. I'm Marsha Weiss and I'm the Director of the Textile Design Programs at Thomas Jefferson University. And I'm very pleased to welcome a panel discussion moderated by Carrie Dillon, the Managing Director of the International Textile Alliance. The panel topic for today is the current state of the textile industry. And with that, Carrie, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce, introduce the panelists and uh, we'll let you kick it off. As a reminder to all of our guests, please put any questions in the chat box. We will be monitoring that and we will share the questions with our panelists um, through, throughout, so thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Um, I want to start by thanking Design Philadelphia and Marsha Weiss and Jefferson for inviting us to participate in the symposium today. Um, as Marsha mentioned, my name is Carrie Dillon. I'm the Managing Director of International Textile Alliance, or ITA. We are a nonprofit business association whose members include leather mills, um, I'm sorry, textile mills, leather tanneries, and trimmings manufacturers. We produce a biannual trade show for our members, and we have an educational foundation focused on educating our members and bringing new talent into the industry. Uh, the ITA is governed by a board of directors, and each of our panelists today is either a current or former member of the board. And so if you'll allow me to introduce them. Um, we have Wesley Mancini, who is a textile designer and president of Wesley Mancini Limited. Jack Egger is the senior vice president of Krypton Fabric. Kelly DeFogio is, thanks Jack. Kelly DeFogio is the current ITA president and the director of sales and merchandising for Stein Fibers. Catherine Richardson is our current vice president for the ITA and is the vice president of sales for Libico. And Catherine Schoff is a current board member and the director of sales and merchandising for Radiate Textiles. Um, we'll spend the first few minutes talking about how COVID has impacted our industry, but I feel like you guys have probably all had enough to talk about that. Um, so then I'd like to change the focus to some talk about trends and inspiration and career advice from our panel. Um, and again, as Marcia mentioned, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will address those at the end of the discussion. So with that, I would like to direct the first question to the entire panel, whoever wants to jump in. Um, so what, over the past few months, what is the greatest leadership insight you have learned while navigating the pandemic and economic downturn? Does anyone have any great leadership insight? I'll give it a shot anyway. It might not be great, but it'll be first anyway. So <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. So I think, I think what, in terms of leadership, I think what, what the message is, is act quickly. Uh, you have to right size your business for now. Uh, be transparent in the message to your associates. They need to know what's going on, why you're doing what you're doing and what the plan is for recovery. Um, I know it sounds silly, it sounds obvious, but have good people around you and, and you find out in a situation like this, how good the people are around you. Um, another one that might not be an option for some people, but be well financed. Have money to, to really um, navigate a downturn like this. Uh, another piece of advice I would have will be, if you can, try not to cut inventory. Try to almost act as if business as usual going forward. I'll give you an example. Some of our customers, I see some of our distributor customers are buying books and, and buying product to put in books to because they want to be ready when things turn and they put themselves in a posi position to succeed. And if you're a little bit reticent to do that, you're going to be left behind when the inevitable um, recovery starts. Thank you, Jack. Um, we'll start um, let's do one more question about COVID before we uh, get to the more exciting stuff. Um, and this too is, is to the entire panel, anybody that wants to jump in, but um, if you could share any unexpected opportunity or silver lining that emerged during the pandemic. Um, and Kelly and I, <laughs> Kelly and I both 
had career changes during the pandemic. So, you know, um, blessing in disguise as it turned out to be for both of us, I think. I think both of us ended up um, in really good situations and so you never know. Wes, did you, were you gonna say something? Sorry, you were raising your hand. Yeah, um, are you done? Yeah, no, I'm good, yeah. Okay, well, I was surprised that we could actually work remotely. It, it was not ideal um, because in the studio, there's one voice. And so the mill would send fabrics to me and then the changes that would have to be made would then have to be mailed or picked up by a designer. Um, and it was just, took a lot longer to get stuff done, but we could get it done. And that was what was surprising to me. That is a silver lining. Yeah. I think everybody's business has been really well, been better through all this for sure. So I think people are spending more time in their homes. I think they're doing projects that they haven't had a lot of time to do, um, redecorating. So mm -hmm. I agree with that. I think back to, you know, comment on the, the leadership question that you posed at the beginning to carry the silver lining as well is, is the recognition um, that the well-being of your business really does depend on the well-being of your employees. And there is a very difficult and fine line sometimes where you have to walk to balance both of those. I think all of us have had to find new methods of uh, managing through this situation. And it's offered a lot of great new insights into being more flexible, shifting in this time of pandemic, and hopefully opening new opportunities like the other ladies have mentioned. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm glad that Kevin, you touched on um, that overall the textile industry, most of our members seem to be doing very well right now. And, and that may be the result of everybody sitting at home and not liking what they see, but that is a, um, I guess a, a blessing for our members. Um, well, I feel like COVID, COVID in a way kind of forced us to slow down a little bit. Um, you know, from a silver lining on the home front, I mean, it, it gave me an opportunity to spend more time as a family um, with my children and my husband. And we were not running from soccer to football and here and there and everywhere else. So it was just nice to um, slow down and have dinner together at a dinner table and talk about the day, which it seemed to be the same day over and over again there for a little bit, but it, it was nice <laughs> to slow down and, and have that interaction. And I feel like everybody across the nation was doing that and maybe didn't take those vacations that they normally would have taken and, and decided to put that money in the home. And I think our, our manufacturers are kind of reaping the reward from that a little bit because we have seen an upturn in the market. It's interesting. I think a lot of your um, viewers will, will be interested to hear on the flip side, while home is doing really well, fashion is not. And for us as a mill, we do both fashion apparel, fabrics, and home textiles. And we see, you know, in good times, one sector seems to be doing well and the other doesn't do as well. So it's nice to have both. But I can imagine the upside we're seeing in home is certainly not what they're seeing on the fashion side. And Catherine, to add to that quickly, uh, same thing. Our business is split residentially and commercially with contract and hospitality. And that mm -hmm. sector is slow to recover. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be a while. So I think the beauty of a business like ours is and yours is the fact that you've got more than one segment so that, you know, if, if you had all your eggs in one basket and that basket was safe right now, either contract or fashion, we, it'd be a different story for both companies. That's right. Diversify, diversify, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, thank you all for that. I want to start this, this next question can be um, for everyone, but as with Wes as our resident textile designer on the panel, I'd like to start with him. Um, Wes, where have you, you know, without being able to travel and, and you know, shop some of the different ways that you usually would find inspiration, um, where have you looked during the pandemic to, to find inspiration for your designs? We have so much inspiration here that we've never used that we're able to pull back and look at what we've, what we've passed over in the past or items that are now marketable and trendy where before they might not have been. Um, so we really didn't have any issues with looking for inspiration. 
Can you talk a little bit about your archive or the archives that you have at your studio? Sure, we have um, historic textiles from the 1800s uh, to tribal uh, textiles, uh, African. In the beginning, it was very uh, classically European um, that we focused on because it was a traditional market, but now it's very uh, uh, global, more, more in a nomad world. So it's a different market altogether. Um, yeah, thank I you. Bought tons of historic um, documents, but now the global thing is a different thing altogether. What about um, I, Kelly and, and um, Catherine, you both have a, a, I guess, the merchandising side to your role. Um, where have you looked to your inspiration and has it, has it been different than it was prior to, to the pandemic? Well, we certainly def we certainly get inspiration from travel and, you know, I call it recon where we go and travel to big cities and shop retail and art museums and all those fun things. Um, and you're, you're not able to do that. Um, so, I mean, I still, you can still go on the internet and get inspiration. You can still get inspiration from, you know, magazines, publishing. I'm old school. I'm, I mean, we're textile people. I'm very tactile. I love a magazine. I still have stacks and stacks of magazines and books. Um, Amazon's a wonderful tool. You can still get books and order those and have those delivered and flip through and earmark and, um, I think we're always doing that and um, trying to find inspiration through just, all, it's everywhere, it's in nature. I, I really think nature and is a great inspiration, so. I think talking to one another as well. A nice thing about our organization, I mean, I think Kelly and I spend more time on the phone with each other <laughs> and yeah. Carrie and just, just talking about what's happening out there, what everyone's seeing to get a more full view of the marketplace so we can understand where the opportunities are. Um, it's, it's a changing market. And the idea now is how to stay nimble, even if you are a larger company, because the opportunities are very, very slim and you got to fit in there at the right moment to get that opportunity um, to make that your own. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, well, thank you. Um, staying on that on that theme of, of trends and inspiration, what are or what would y'all say are some of the emerging trends in um, home furnishing and textile design? Kelly, you had a good one yesterday, I thought. Well, I mean, in in talking with with these ladies, I mean, I know we talk and we bounce things off of each other. Catherine and I talked it was probably a month ago. Um, with COVID, I think people are looking for cleanable fabrics, things they can take off and wash. Um, you know, also with COVID, people are thinking of what they're bringing to their homes. So, you know, Catherine had told me a couple of months ago that vegetable dyes were a possible, you know, trend that was emerging because people are not wanting chemicals in their home now. So I think you know, with the whole COVID thing, um, it, it, it's making people reconsider, you know, their environment and what they're bringing in it and what does their environment look like and is their environment calming? Um, you know, I think if we're spending more time, time in our home, we want it to be a retreat now. And I think that that's kind of where the trend is kind of maybe leaning towards. I would agree with what Kelly just said in terms of the need for uh, performance fabrics. I know I don't want that to sound, you know, self-serving since we're in the performance fabric business, but I think it's it's a reality, and I think that we were lucky in that we were already in that space, and we're already in the in a position of transitioning our message message a little bit to wellness. So we we've always had an antimicrobial component to our product uh, in Krypton Home. And we, and it was really, we, we, we marketed that as odor control, but the reality is it's antibacterial. And I think that is going to serve that, that market, the home market well uh, in this time when people are looking for that. So I think a, a combination of cleanability and wellness is, is really going to be important. I 
Don't you think too, Jack, uh, uh, trans transparency, um, as Kelly was pointing out, people want to know what's going into their homes. And so understanding what the products are about is more interesting and, and definitely a trend. Absolutely. I, I think that there's, I think you're going to see that a little more transparency from a lot of different companies and looking at the pluses and minuses of their ways to getting to performance, because as we know, there are a lot of different ways to get there. Uh, and, you know, everybody I'm sure is in a position to where they can make a case for their own product as to why that is the best service. I mean, that's not, that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about just what are the trends and, and, and the market will decide who's better, who is be better uh, prepared to service their needs. I think in stock fabrics are in, uh, on trend. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. As far as design goes in, in my studio, um, besides uh, Moroccan is definitely something that we've produced several seasons in a row. And we also always have a skin of some sort, um, which I wanted to pipe in before the, the last question about um, inspiration with the internet. I never used to look on the internet, but to find new skins, I do that. So like uh, an eagle ray or a, um, a basking whale skin. So anyway, I'll, I'll move on to um, uh, fabrics that are look hand uh, designed, hand woven, and very textural. Um, not where a wee was just plugged in into an area, but that there's surface interest. Um, and I'm all about surface interest. And then to Jack. Yes. Not to be negative Nancy, but with the people uh, bringing in their home wellness, the um, performance fabrics, are they biodegradable of any way? There's, there's a biodegradable component to a lot of the new yarns that are coming in. I think Kelly addressed that in, in, a, previous, um, in a previous seminar that we did together. And I do think that, that that's gonna also be a trend where people are gonna have to combine not just, not just cleanability and wellness, but sustainability. And I think that there's going to be a, a social conscience to, the, to this uh, movement moving forward. Mm -hmm. For sure, we, we see that too. I mean, we've always seen that drive for sustainability being a linen mill, but I do see it from all different customers now with the demand. Uh, and also all of the seminars and shows and trade shows that we all attend, the themes are moving more and more towards sustainability and sustainability from a fiber use from a manufacturing perspective and also from a holistic business sense. So I think there's multiple um, facets to that. Right. And also adding adding lifetime to the product. If you can if you can sustain the life of the fabric or the furniture, that's a real, real heavy co component of, of contributing to sustainability. How are we gonna stay in business with designing new new patterns? You gotta always have something new, Wes. <laughs> That's a big trend too. It's interesting, I think, and, and you, maybe you can speak to this better than I can or, or Catherine can too from the design perspective, but it does seem like the newness is still really important, but so much newness all at once isn't a focus. It's little snips here and there rather than two huge collections per year, is that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're um, we're gonna try to start coming out with fabric four times a year instead of two, just kind of in between so that, you know, we're just working. I think people work differently now. I think I think um, everybody's kind of taking a step back and, and looking at how we work. And, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I don't, I, we're constantly designing, Wes, right? Like you're constantly looking for stuff. It doesn't stop. So, you know, it just, I don't know. I think um, our customers want to see new stuff more often, I think, that, than we're letting, that we're giving them products. So um, just kind of changing the way we're doing things. So, yeah, we're, we're developing product year round, not just for twice a year as well. Um, people are always doing projects. And even though they say they're not working, 
and I'm talking yeah. about our buyers. Yeah. Um, they are always wanting to look at new product and you have new products. So um, we are developing product year round. Kelly, so I think you're right. I mean, I think the market, even like pre-market was bigger. People are shopping before showtime. They're shopping after showtime, if they, even if they don't go to showtime. So it's, it, that's process of, of, of selecting fabrics has really just, it's just redefined the calendar. And, and I think that's, that happened a contract a few years ago where everybody used to, you know, use Neocon, which was the big contract show and they would bring out all their product around Neocon. That stopped and then people just started to bring out product when they were ready. And, and I think that almost upped the game of the product because once you're on a deadline like that, maybe you have to make some compromises. But when you can bring out product when you're ready, you're making better aesthetic decisions. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think a lot of times I know, like from my past, like we crunch everything like that. We have to get it ready for showtime and everything. We kind of we wait to the last minute. I think we're starting to work smarter. Um, and I know from being on the merchandising side before in my past, you know, you've been looking at all these fabrics for so long. You're excited to get some new collections in. So. I think that, you know, we try to do mid-season in between our fabric show times, we try to do mid-season lines, but I think it's become, gonna become even more important. Well, I wanna talk a little bit about your career backgrounds. Um, and one question that I thought might be interesting to the students was if you could share um, your biggest mistake and what you learned from it. <laughs> oh God, do we have That's a day? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes in my career. I don't know if I could like sit here and quantify it. Um, but I, I would say the one thing that I think is crucial is you're going to make mistakes. It's inevitable. I mean, even now I'm going to make a mistake. I, I'll fat finger a calculation and plug in a wrong number and I'm going to make a mistake. It's part of being human, but I think the main thing that everybody should take away from that is we're going to make mistakes as long as you learn from them and you grow from them. That's the best advice for me. And as an employer, if you make a mistake, it's okay to make a mistake, but fix it. Don't come to me with problems. Come to me with solutions or, tr you know, try to get that problem resolved before it's bigger than what it should be. Um, to me, I think that's, that's the biggest takeaway as far as like making mistakes in the industry or, or making a mistake in general with any job that you go to after you graduate is, you know, learn from it and, you know, don't take problems to the, to up the ladder, take solutions. I like that. That's good. But does anybody want to share an embarrassing story about this? <laughs> Anyone? Well, I have a story, but it's not embarrassing. But my biggest <laughs> mistake. Was, we can make it embarrassing, Wes. <laughs> um, in the beginning of my career, my studio kept growing and growing and growing to the point where I had a staff of 30. And then uh, 2001 happened, which is the lifting of the trade embargo, which the country was flooded with foreign textiles. And I kept my people way too long. And so as a businessman, that was a really huge mistake. And as designers, we're not really trained as businessmen, yeah. business people. So anyway, that was a huge mistake. I, I have a mistake from the same era probably Wes, I, um, in my, in my younger days when my hair was a different color than it is now, um, I had, I suffered probably from a lack of, or excuse me, from a, uh, a case of overconfidence. And I remember sitting with our bankers at, at one point and they were talking about what would happen if the business hit a downturn. And I looked at them and I said, that's not going to happen here. That's why you have me. And I'll never forget saying that. And I'm thinking then, of course, within like 15 minutes afterward, we hit a downturn and I was damn right in the middle of it. So <laughs> at that point, you realize it's you, you got it. You got to 
prepare for bad times when there are times that are good and, and you can't be overconfident. You've, you've got to be confident enough to succeed, but not overconfident enough to think that you can't fail. So. That's well, good. and I think we're always learning. Like, I think that's the one thing about this industry is I, I've never stopped learning. I, I never think I know it all. Things are, are, you know, trends change, you know, ways of working change, everything changes. So I think you just have to learn how to take your mistakes that you make and learn from them and, and grow and become better. And because um, I've had plenty of mistakes, trust me. So I think we all have. But um, but yeah, just just learning how to how to how to take constructive criticism. I think that's a huge thing because, um, you know, in our in our business, we have we we get criticized, you know, you, you know, it's design, you know, you don't like something, you can't take it to heart. You have to, to just, you know, it's someone's opinion. So just, just, you know, roll with it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that was, that was something that Todd um, shared in his presentation, he made a presentation earlier. So I think that's, that's great that you would reinforce that. It's a, that's a good point. Um, what about, would anyone like to share a, a good lesson that they've learned from a mentor? I, th I think that mentors are very important, um, especially in this industry that's so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very tight-knit tight -knit is, is a good way to put it. Um, yeah. A very tight-knit industry. Um, and so I think everyone has has a mentor. Um, any any great lessons that you'd be willing to share? I, I have one that I've, I've kept with me my entire career. And that was when I was, um, an assistant to Jack Leonard Larson at Haystack. And he said never to have the brightest, the most intense color be either the lightest or the darkest in value. And that's really um, has worked my, in my career. Because if it is, then that color stands out way beyond. It's, it doesn't blend in. You have to squint your eyes and make sure it's pleasing, right, Wes? Mm -hmm. Squint, yeah. Nothing needs to jump. That's right. So, uh, go, go ahead, ahead. go ahead, no, no, good. Mine are real quick. I was just gonna say my two lessons that reverberate in my ear all the time. One came from the CEO of a company when I was younger and the other came from someone who now works for me but used to be my trainer when I was in another company. So it, lessons can come from anywhere. Um, and the, the one from my, my friend and colleague, Ed, is do it now. So, you know, anti-procrastination, which is always good in our business because you can get distracted for many different reasons. And the other one was a focus on the line between romanticizing and selling in a way that's very story oriented, because that's how we do with, with sales and textiles. It is a romantic business in so many ways. It is tactile. It is emotional. And you can't get lost in that as a merchant as well. So it's finding that fine line. And so not to belabor the point, my other mentor said to me, just shut up and say what you need to say. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I love it. So um, Kelly, Kelly and I were actually talking yesterday. I had an amazing mentor and she took me under her wing and taught me everything like she included me in every meeting ever everything she was awesome and um i remember my very first review she told me she said you know you're you everything i ask you to do you do it and you do a great job of it but i need for you to be proactive and i need you to look for things that you know don't wait for me to tell you what to do find something and that's not right and fix it and so that's stuck with me all these years you know that's what good you know to become a good leader, you want to be able to show that you can, you can find things that are wrong and fix them and not just wait for someone to come and, and tell you that it's wrong. So I think that's, that's stuck with me in life just in general. So. Yeah, I would say my biggest lesson that was taught to me was intentionally taught to me. Um, I was at a, another member company and I was hired as the sales assistant to three salespeople and the president of the division. And one of the salespeople left and there was this opening and I really felt like I was the fit for this job. Like I, I just was like, I'm, I'm a shoe in for this. They're just going to give me this position. And they started interviewing candidates and candidates kept coming in and interviewing with the president. 
And finally, I got so fed up to seeing all these people coming in because I was like, I'm better than that person. I can do that. Why are they bringing this person in here? And I um, finally, at the end of the day, I waited for the last interview to leave. And I got up and I went into the president's office and I sat down and I said, I need a minute of your time. And he said, yes. And I said, well, first of all, I want to know why you're interviewing all these people for this open position when you have the perfect candidate already here sitting in front of you. Like, I feel like this position is perfect for me. And he said, you're right, it is. We've just been waiting for you to come in and ask for it. So for me, it was a wonderful lesson of no one's going to hand it to you. You have to show up and you have to ask for it. And that was one of my first lessons in the industry. And it's something that I will never forget. So if you want something, you've got to, you got to have, you know, the forthright to go and, and, and say it's yours and ask for it. That's a great one, Kelly. I love that one. Well, you know who it was. Yeah. <laughs> so my, I have one that I, a couple that I learned from a few of my mentors. One of them was, you don't always have to be the smartest person in the room, but you better be the person in the room who knows more, most about your product. Mm -hmm. And that's toward preparation. So you, yeah. can, and you can never be surprised. Um, the other one, and, and followed up on, again on Catherine Richardson about, about the romanticizing of business and talking a lot. The guy said to me, when you get the order, fold up your samples and get the hell out of the room. <laughs> and I think that's, that's a good lesson for us all. Oh. That's the mic drop. <laughs> um, is there any, you know, going back to your career and, and is there any advice that you can share with the students? Um, on things that you wish you knew about this industry before before coming into it. Um, I think home textiles is a unique industry. Um, and I don't, I don't know if there's any insight you could share that maybe isn't something people would run into in another industry. Um, well, I can share one one thing. And, and, and the reason that it's been pointed out to me is because I've joined a company um, that's new to the fabric industry, but they're also textile related, they're in the fiber side. Um, but what they find very interesting about the fabric side of the business is that we're all competitors, but we all go out and have drinks and we go to lunch and we're exchanging information and we have a good time and, um, and we enjoy each other and we don't hate each other. And they think that that is just so strange because in that side of the business, that side of the business is so cutthroat and they're fighting for a half of a penny to get the business. And, you know, you don't hang out with your competitor. You don't exchange information with a competitor. So, um, you know, that's one thing that is different about our industry that I think is different in some of the others is we do get along. We do exchange information. Um, we do share that amongst our friendly competitors. Um, so I, I do think that's a, a, a different view of what people may think. It, it does feel, we are a large industry, but it feels small, close knit, knit kind of community atmosphere. Yeah, so that was maybe got his bad side, right? Yes. <laughs> I think that's that's key because you're you they're gonna come back around. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you mentioned, Catherine, that somebody that used to that trained you previously and now you're their boss. So it's a good thing they didn't do anything but to step it in. <laughs> he was a good one, right? Um, I think too it's also important if you're interested at all in textiles or in the fiber or fiber arts. In any way, shape, or form, just find somebody who's in the industry to talk to. Just pick their brain because there are so many ways to fall into positions, you know, jobs that are not intentional. I think, you know, we've all talked on panels and I know some history, and I don't know that any one of us intended on doing this as a career. Maybe yeah. Wes, um, <laughs> as an exception, um, because you have that degree and background and uh, as a study path. But um, I think all of us can attest to the fact that you don't know what's available in our industry as a job until you get into it. 
So if you're interested, find out, uh, you know, jobber. P people come to me all the time as potential buyers of fabric. And I say, I'm sorry, you know, we sell to jobbers and they say, what is that? So it's amazing to me how many positions are out there in different avenues in the textile industry that you just don't know they exist yet. And get it, get in the door, get in the door. And that's internships. And you know, it's easy to say, I'm gonna go find an internship because there's not a lot of them available that are paid. Sometimes you may have to go in and not be paid. If you have that luxury, just go in, off, volunteer your services, get in the door. Find out if you like it. And, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of unpaid internships because people are not going to turn down help that they feel like, you know, that, that they're getting for free. Um, and then you'll find out about them. They'll find out about you and you'll find out about this business. And honestly, I think and, and that you will probably find out whether you like it or whether you don't pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not devoting your, your entire life or career to finding out if you like, take the shot. Mm -hmm. Well, and to that point, it, I'm happy to any, any of the students um, that are interested in connecting with someone in our industry, um, please feel free to reach out to me and Marsha has my contact information. Um, and I'd be happy to, to help connect you with someone in our industry. Um, along those same lines, we are, Reinstituting our internship program this year, which does have a small stipend um, that we provide. We try to connect students with our member companies, um, and there is a there is a bit of, of money there to um, help support the students. And so, if you're interested in internships as well, then then please um, reach out to me, and I'll see if we can't connect you with um, someone in our industry. That that I mean, the internships are a great opportunity to learn a lot that you just you really can't learn anywhere else. Well, and actually this, that goes to, to kind of my next question. Any advice that you can offer young professionals on securing a job in the textile industry? I, I almost feel like we've answered, you know, yeah. answered that with our previous question. Um, all right, what about an average day for any of you? Does anyone have an average day? No. <laughs> which, which I think that's one of the great things. I mean, I, my day is never average, um, which I love, but. No, I mean, some days you're, you're dressed up and, you know, showing fabrics and, you know, it looks glamorous. Next day you're in tennis shoes and sweatpants and you're crawling up and down ladders, and, you know, just uh, you've got fabric fuzz all over you. So it's, there's never a different day, never a dull day, never a same day. Um, and that's what I love about it. You're not sitting at a desk all day. Um, you know, you're, looking, you're out looking for creative ideas and you're inspired all these different, you know, when you're, I mean, I get inspired all the time. When, you're, when I'm out anywhere, you know, you can get inspired. Um, like Kelly said, outside, you know, everything. So, um, but yeah, no, no days average here. Agreed. <laughs> well, I mean, I, any, if anyone has any questions too, we, we've got, um, we still have a little bit of time and would love to, to take any questions from the students. Um, see, in the meantime, while, we, while I'm waiting to see if we have any questions. And, and Carrie, we do, we do have oh. questions. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to start sharing them with you. Okay, thank you. So we're all pandemic weary. On the other side of this, do you see opportunities for the US textile industry coming back even stronger than it was pre-COVID, do you see domestic manufacturing making a comeback? It better be. We just bought a mill in the last year. So, <laughs> so we, yeah. we firmly believe in the reemergence of, of the U.S. textile manufacturing um, community. Uh, we think there's going to be uh, a a feeling for people that they need to control their own destiny. They want to feel safe in terms of closeness um, of the supply chain. And I think there's going to be a resurgence of nationalism, I hope. Uh, and I think it's going to let really bode well for the, for the textile community in the United States. 
I mean, we even see that as an international company because we're a Belgian company and obviously they're not that many people who produce and weave flax in the United States. Um, it, it is more of a focus on hemp right now. And we see that as a really big push, especially in domestic uh, continental United States. So that's an interesting idea for us. And I, I also think that it has to do with shipping challenges. Post COVID, it's gonna be a different world with shifts in the airlines and the shipping companies and the challenges we've all had to face through that. So I think as a necessity, it's a lot of it's going to have to be domestic and sourced on, on the United States soil, which is interesting. And hopefully that's uh, seen as a positive, although I can see it also could be a challenge if you're an international company finding those, finding new resources domestically. So, mm -hmm. so a number of you spoke about the going to more than sort of two major lines a year. So creating more product that your customers want to see product on an ongoing basis. Does that mean, is the pace accelerating in home furnishings or is it not so much about two major lines a year anymore? I think we're still working um, at the same pace, I would say. I just think we're working smarter. I think we're planning things out more. Um, I think we're more, uh, our focus is more directed, I think, um, because I think a lot of times, you know, when you're just focused on two shows a year, you feel like you've got all this time to think about, you know, what we're going to do for showtime. So you've got a couple months of kind of creative time. Now, I think instead of that, I think we're kind of jumping in and saying we're going to do this. So I think maybe the pace is up a little bit, but still, you know, we're, we're constantly designing. Mm hmm yeah, I agree with that. It's a constant design. It's from starting a new one every day and um, finishing one the same day, but that it's in a different train um, wherever they started and then. So it's not more, you're right, to me, it's just constantly doing it without any particular goal at the end as far as timeline. Hmm. So I was actually from the first sorry. sorry. Um, I think from a sales perspective, I think the designers are, like Wes said, doing it at, at the same pace of what they were doing it. Um, we've been trained to only show it twice a year at Fabric Market, um, but from the sales side and someone who has always worked close with the designers and helped with merchandising, I'm always in their room, like asking for a snippet of that. I'm, I'm a designer's worst nightmare because I'm seeing wonderful things coming down the pipeline and say, thinking, all this customer, I know they're working on a project. That would be perfect for them. Can I take it and show them that it's not ready? No, but it's fine. It doesn't have a backing on it and you only have one color, but I can still sell it. So I think in that aspect, um, you know, from constantly trying to do that and get back in the door and get a review after showtime, we've kind of developed into this mini line after the fabric market. So, um, you know, like I said, most designers hate me in sales because I'm always in there asking questions, wanting to like go through stuff and take stuff out before it's ready. But anyway, just the sales side of it. Yeah, well, I was going to say I've had to change the way I work. The company that I was working um, for before, um, we were we manufactured in North Carolina. And so if I wanted something color work done on something, I could get it that week. Now I'm looking, I'm working with a company that imports from India. So if I send in color work, it takes at least a month to get it back. So I have to be really smart when I do my color work and think about all the way through because it's going to be another month if something's not right. Um, I'm double checking my numbers on everything. Just it's stressful. So, but it's just, it's just different. Um, you know, you know, if you get something back and it's wrong, like I said, it's going to take a while. So it's just, I've had to change the way I work, um, which has been an adjustment. I, I think Kelly's right that everybody in, I know in our company, everybody's become a designer, including me, because we, because we have meetings now, interdepartmental meetings where you've got design and, and marketing and sales and everybody on the same call. And the designers are presenting, even in their development stages, fabrics that are not finished yet, where they're looking for, looking for some input as to which way to go, but not really looking for some input. 
because <laughs> I think Kelly's right. They really are not sure they want to hear from us. They make pretend they want to hear from us, but they really don't. So you met a lot of our team this morning, and I don't care what their titles were on that screen. Every one of them's a designer. So. <laughs> Well, and, and Jack, Jack, they all shared that their path to their, their current position was through you. You know what that means, Marcia? It means, it means I'm old. That's, <laughs> and I have to tell you, so as Marcia knows, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia and, and our plant was 20 minutes from Philadelphia, Philadelphia University, Jefferson, which was Philadelphia Textile. And we always had interns from, from the school. So, the, and it was a great experience for us and for them. The problem is when you stay in this business forever is a lot of the people who worked for you now have big jobs, which is great. And, and in theory helps you. But when you didn't hire somebody, like when they got out of school and you interviewed five people for one job, the other four people come back to haunt you for the rest of your life. So, <laughs> No, you're a nice guy. They still like you. <laughs> I'll give you a list, Kelly. <laughs> well, and, and that's a perfect time for me to pivot to a different question off that. So, so uh, Wesley, this question is for you specifically. One of, our, one of our students wants to know, do you have any advice for a designer right out of school in their first, entering their first corporate textile design role? Do they have a job already? In this case, yes. Um, my advice is to do everything that you're asked for, that nothing is beneath you. Um, you're there to learn and just do it. You can't, you can't like say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm too hoity-toity. I can't, you know, cut samples or I can't sit on the floor and do this. You have to be able to do everything. And what, what if they didn't have a position yet? How would your advice change? My advice there would be not to give up on uh, searching for a job. Um, there's plenty of people that I went to graduate school who gave up looking for a job and ended up being, um, you know, uh, weird jobs and never came back into the textile uh, business. So if you give up on yourself, then no one else is going to get pull you back. Well, and that's two, two of you shared that you had career changes during the pandemic. So really a very positive uh, silver lining to this craziness. H how did those come about? How did you find new opportunities during the pandemic? Well, well, I'll start. I Well, first I wanna say Wes's advice was spot on for anybody that's getting a career right after they graduate. Nothing is beneath you. Do everything you're asked to do. And I, and I, I still think that's a motto for me today. If my boss asked me to clean a toilet today, I'd clean a toilet. Like nothing's beneath me. I'm I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to get the job done. I don't um, know if I would clean a toilet, Kelly. I got it. <laughs> I use that loosely. Um, <laughs> but we're all vice presidents and and at that level or higher, and we're all still getting on ladders and cleaning floors and cutting samples. So that's never gonna change. No, no, yeah. never gonna change. Um, and, and it's probably why we're in the positions that we're in because we're willing to do whatever we got to do to get the job done. But talking about the career change, I was, it, it was just a, they had reached out to me right before the pandemic happened. And um, I basically didn't take the interview because we were shelter in place at that, um, the very next week. So um, it probably went another three or four months uh, longer than it should have, um, but I did eventually take the job. And one of the reasons that I took the job was that, you know, if they are still hiring in this type of environment, then I knew that it was, you know, financially a, a good company to be with at that time. So that is the reason that I took the position. So um, I was a COVID cutback. Um, and I had been with the company um, almost eight years, seven or eight years, and I thought my world was just, had fallen apart. It was, it was horrible, you know, because you had all this, all these changes and everything going on in your life, and then all of a sudden, you know, you don't have a job. It's scary, and I'll be honest, I thought briefly about getting out of the industry just because I was like, you know what, I, maybe I need to do something different with my life. 
Um, but the problem is uh, once you get this industry in your blood, you can't get it out. And, you know, I had, I had, it was amazing to me. And I found out who my friends were. I had so many people calling me, checking on me. Um, what do you need? Who can I call? And um, the job that I got was um, when a, a very good friend of mine called and, and said, hey, we've got someone that needs a job right now. And um, so, you know, it's amazing how, how we all pull together, you know, if, if I had, if anybody I know needs a job, I'm always trying to help. Like, it's just, that's just what we do. Um, we look after each other. And so um, I actually ended up in a better position um, and I'm happy. I'm, I'm working with some really nice products um, and just getting to travel more and, and calling on bigger accounts. So it's exciting. So it was, it was a blessing in disguise. Although it didn't feel like it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think good, good people are always, always hard to find, even though there's so many people looking for work out there. If you can set yourself apart in some way or you have some track record you can point to and you're not afraid to humbly call out your own achievements in a way that says I can benefit your company, um, it's not about what you need and that's why I should hire you. It's about what you can do for my company and a spark of drive or imagination or inspiration that we as, as employers find in you that will make the difference. But good people are always, always hard to find. Those are excellent points. And I have so many questions as follow up, I'm, but I'm conscious that we have only a few minutes left and we've got a list of questions to get to. Uh, with retailers closing and consumer behavior changing, how do you think the need for home products will be affected? Do you think it will be business as usual or will you start to develop products differently? I personally think business as usual. I mean, we've seen an uptick in our internet sales of furniture. Um, and you can see that during the pandemic, our furniture sales have increased tremendously. Um, majority of my customers can't get product out quick enough. They have the largest backlog of orders ever, history of their companies. Um, we have a foam shortage and a lumber shortage, and that's the only reason that they're not able to get it out and an employee shortage, uh, that they can't get it out quicker. So, um, you know, we're at unprecedented historical like backlog times for furniture manufacturers right now. So um, I'd have to say business as usual. We just have to learn a different way of getting it done. I think one of the changes I see is in specifically in furniture companies, traditional old companies who may not have had a e-commerce presence are partnering up with people who are really strong at it. And so I was talking to the CEO of a of, of, of top like 15 or 20 uh, manufacturer. And he said, 1% of my business was 1% of his business was e-commerce. So they went out and bought an expert in e-commerce. They bought a company mm -hmm. who did nothing but e-commerce. And now not only are they strong there with that company, but those, those areas of expertise rolled over into their core business too. And they've gotten better. Well, and Wesley's point about um, the trend of textured products being really important is really key. When you're looking at buying on the internet, we hear pre-COVID, we heard all the time, it has to uh, be able to be seen over the internet what the value of the product is. So a plain weave that doesn't have any texture or doesn't photograph well to show that texture does not do as well as, as a product that you can see the value in. So looking at products in, in development now, that's a really key thought now that there is so much online business being done. So the product development for us has definitely changed to looking at how it photographs on, on the web and making sure that we can convey the, the price point, the value, and, and the marriage of that through the photo. Good point. And, and I would think that would translate very directly to our students as well in terms of how they are showcasing their work through social media or through their websites is that, that those same qualities need to translate into their work. Mm -hmm. 
One last question for all of you. Uh, what are some of your best practices as managers to foster the best people? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I want to say that, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that you're only as good as the people that work for you. Like they, they're, you know, you want to hire really good people because um, I think in turn they make you look better at the end of the day. But I think that, you know, it, 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 I think it's so important to try to build people up that work for you. And, and I just, would you guys not agree? Like just do whatever you can to make them grow and, 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 and just become more creative, more talented. I think that's super important. And, and include them, Catherine. Also, I would Absolutely. say we have the, in the age of Zoom, we have Zoom meetings all day long. We have, we have sales council meetings. We have design, me, design and marketing meetings. We have company-wide meetings. We, you know, uh, Zoom is making a fortune off of our uh, su subscription money here. So, <laughs> but I think what it's done though is made everybody feel like a part of the team, which I think is a really, a really good thing. And, and another crazy uh, advice, hire the right people in the beginning which <laughs> if it were that easy, everybody would have the right people. But I think once you continue to make the right hires over a period of time, things start to look up for you. I think a good boss is one that's not going to be intimida intimidated or, you know, by, by you. Like, you know what I mean? They're going to they're gonna want to build you up. They're going to want to make you better. Because like I said, in turn, it's going to make them look good. So why would you not want that? So... I also feel like transparent feedback too. Um, I feel like sometimes, and I will speak to my own career, um, sometimes it's hard to get good, honest criticism or feedback on how to be better at what you're doing. And when you do get that feedback, look at it as a positive of someone investing in you. It's not always critical. Look at it as learning to better yourself um, you, you can take criticism one or two ways. And I think the way you take criticism and learn of, you know, self, self growth is, is the way to look at that. Um, don't take it negatively. Um, hopefully you'll have a manager that'll give you the criticism, the constructive criticism in a way that it doesn't seem negative. But, um, I think honest transparency, as far as what you need to do to better, to be better at what you're doing, your job, sales, design, whatever that is. Um, and I think the biggest and most important lesson is to learn to listen. I think people learn to, they, they listen to respond instead of just listening to understand. Um, so listening is key in whatever you do. I agree. I think adding to everything that everyone said, I agree with. And I would only add that empowering everyone to be able to make decisions especially if they're dealing with the public or your customers, creates an environment where people have personal responsibility for the success of your team. And it also makes my job easier. So I'm not the bottleneck having to answer or sign off on every single question or project. Um, empowering everybody at every level, giving them the parameters, giving them the overarching goals of what the company is about or what our mission is about, but letting them make decisions and empowering them to do so on your behalf is really key. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, I think I've got the perfect comment slash quote from one of our students, Sophia Turco. This is the panel I needed. Really nice to hear some realities about the industry. So our great thanks to Carrie, Jack, Catherine, Catherine, Kelly, and Wes. That was a brilliant panel discussion and Thank you to everyone, to all of our guests. Thank you again, everyone, so much. Um, we appreciate your support of our textile design programs and Design Philadelphia. Thanks so much. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.